You know, uh, we've all heard of, um, you know, I had this wonderful conversation with the man who, uh, you know, who was uh, hosted as MC, uh, as a master of ceremonies, many more people than all of us can ever hope to. And I asked him, how do you introduce a great speaker? Ladies and gentlemen, I would appreciate a moment of silence. Thank you. I said, how do you introduce a great speaker? So this gentleman said to me, when I introduced Bill Gates, I knew him well. And I said, Bill Gates. And then he said, I, knew, I introduced John Scully, and I knew John better than I knew Bill. So I said, John. And he said, when I introduced Quincy Jones, I knew him really well, and I said, Q. I have to go shorter than that, shorter than one letter, so. This came off, so somebody has to put it back on. And they don't want my scarf. I will leave my shirt and pants on. I won't fall down, but I will walk down a little bit. When I was in 11th grade, I wasn't going to, I was a painter. I was going to paint and I was going to go to university. And my father, who none, none of my family ever went to college, but he thought I should at least be tested to see what aptitude, if any, I had. So I took three days of testing uh, of what I could do. And I was very anxious about how it would come out. And uh, they said, came back, that I had an aptitude for architecture and for hairdressing. So I haven't been to a barber since I've been 17. And you'll see some pictures of me with my head shaved, and now it's getting really eccentrically bizarre. And uh, I had to put goo in it this morning to have it. When I woke up this morning, I frightened myself when I looked in the mirror. So maybe next time you see me, if you see me, it'll be shaved. Um, out of tradition with the rest of this conference, I'm, I'm not a businessman. Uh, I, I don't work for anybody. I am certainly, uh, I certainly do not play any sport. Sport for me is, since I work at home, is going upstairs to bed. I have a large house, so it's 23 stairs up. Um, I'm not selling anything. Uh, and uh, I don't want to change the world. I have a very simple, simple journey, and I've had it for quite a while. And that is a, uh, an unending embrace with my own personal inabilities, my own stupidity, my own uh, lack of knowledge of this blank slate that I feel I am every morning when I get up, combined with a curiosity about so many things. And my whole life is a series of parallel and sequential journeys uh, that I document. I've done 80-some books on different subjects. I've done about 40-some conferences in different conferences where I can um, I can have, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you would know the word schlepper, but I'm a schlepper, I'm a jerk. I'm, I don't amount to much, I don't have social skills, I don't own a suit, uh, but I've had the privilege in my life to, because I am sort of abrasively charming, that, that, that I can, um, I'm gonna tell some jokes later, that wasn't a joke. <laughs> Uh, that, um, that I can ask people to come for nothing uh, and to have a conversation with me and some of my friends. And they've turned into 
conferences and gatherings. And it's made my life really interesting. And when asked, because I'm, uh, I was giving a, a commencement address about a month ago for one of those honorary things, whether you put on a funny hat. And um, in the middle of the talk, I saw these young people out there. And I stopped, and I looked out there, and I said, I'm 79. That's the new 77. That was a joke. <laughs> I created that joke because about a week before I had dinner with um, Woody Allen, and I said, Woody, I heard that you said that 80 is the new dead. <laughs> and he put his head down and mumbled. He said, I said it, but I didn't make it up. <laughs> Making up a joke is interesting. Um, a joke is the opposite of expectation. The opposite of expectation. It's one of the five ways you can, you can, you can innovate. The construction of a joke is rather interesting and highly creative. It's not a trivial thing. Try to make up a joke. I was so proud of that 77, 79 thing. That's about the only joke I've made up in quite a while. And I thought, but I only made it up because of, the, of talking to Woody. But it wasn't Woody's joke. I made up that joke. And I thought, that's interesting, that whole construct, that journey to find the opposite. So many things are the opposite. I, I, I didn't stay for a lot of yesterday. I stayed for about half the day. And I was reflecting on it in the afternoon. And I realized, well, what did I find interesting? And what I found interesting is, is I, don't, I, I, hardly, I didn't remember anything I agreed with. All I remembered were the things that I disagreed with. And that was interesting. It, it's the disagreement that you have with things that you take away from a conference. It's when you don't agree with somebody up there saying something, that's what impregnates your mind and makes you think. Makes you think of, well, that's a bunch of shit. What idea do I have? What do I have that is an, a different pattern that isn't right about everybody nodding to? I was very excited about seeing uh, the gentleman who uh, did that Skype call. Uh, I thought he was going to be here. I met his, his other half. I just spent a day at Baidu, Baidu in, uh, in, and gave speeches all around Baidu. They had a great big welcoming sign. It was just, I mean, it's sort of delightful. And then, but I think I'm so under the radar. And then they have these big signs, which apparently are easy to do, but very impressive. When you come in a building, there's a billboard saying, welcome, and then your name kind of thing. And when you go out, there's something else on it. So you know it wasn't permanent. <laughs> uh, I thought it was up there. I thought they were just going to have a billboard to me. So anytime I came back, or I could send people there and say, I have a billboard in the beta building. But I so thoroughly disagreed with what he said. And you're not supposed to say that from the stage. But I so thoroughly disagreed with it. I'll, I'll give you a sidebar, then I'll go back to my disagreement. I was asked to give a speech about two years ago. Somebody was having a design conference in Chicago. I live in Rhode Island. And I went there. and. Um, I stayed for the first three speeches, and I didn't like he, the way he was introducing people. And, uh, and he didn't know me, so what was he going to say? And uh, so I, I said that I didn't want him to introduce me. And I would, there was somebody in the audience who knew me. I wanted them to introduce me. So that went on. And then I thought, what's the best thing I can do? I've run a lot of conferences. I've just heard three speakers. I think. Uh, what my speech will be is I will give a critique of the first three speakers. Uh, and I will say what I thought was bad about them and what, I, what they could do. I would coach them. I mean, I have that ability. That would be interesting. And it would really tell you how you might give a better speech and how you, would, what, you, know, how you screwed up in your speech and all. And uh, I gave a rather, a rather acerbic criticism of all three. One has never talked to me again. Uh, but the other two, uh, 
it worked out very well. I'm quite friendly with them. They thanked me. They changed this speech. Uh, one is the, the Frank Stevenson designed the Fiat, designed the, the Mini, and now works for, I don't know, one of the other big fancy cars of, that goes very fast, you know, that, that you would, you can't possibly drive anywhere legally. Right? And um, I, it's, there's a whole series of things in our society uh, that are better than humans are and that we pay money for. There's, the sound systems are better than my ears. And, and you go out and you get convinced that you should buy a sound system that's better than you can hear. It's a very strange thing, extra speakers. I don't, it's, you, you buy systems that presuppose you have six ears. <laughs> there, there really isn't any sense to how things are sold. Cars that, of course, go faster than you possibly can ever drive anywhere. Can you imagine? I was just in, 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 uh, in Beijing, and they had, at my disposal, they had two Teslas always. And uh, the only thing you could say about it is they were very quiet, and they didn't move like any other car. They didn't move because of the traffic. I mean, there was no sense having it. And it wasn't really a different car. It was just a regular car with a, with a battery. I don't see the innovation there. I, I, I don't understand it. That's not innovation. Innovation is not putting a, a camera on the back of a Honda so you can see who you can run over. <laughs> and yet it's advertised as innovation. It's a word that's so overused by many of you in your companies and your businesses. It's not innovation. Innovation is game-changing. That's my only reference I will make to the f former uh, panel. You didn't get that joke either. <laughs> I think I'm quicker than the audience. <laughs> As oft times happens. I'm, I'm giving you a series of thoughts just to show, tell you who I am and how I think, and then I'll get to some content. But it's important to, to tell you how skeptical I am of so many things in order for you to understand the pattern of how I do things. Uh, I remember going to school, and, and in my mind, we'd studied ancient things, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and we'd studied the Bronze Age as being primitive ancient age. It was a Bronze Age. I, didn't, I forgot that the Iron Age was after the Bronze Age. I thought iron was less sophisticated and would be earlier, but it isn't. It's the Bronze Age and then the Iron, iron Age, I believe, and the, iron, the Bronze Age. And then I was thinking, wow, that's really interesting. How do you make bronze? How, if I asked you to go out and make me some bronze, uh, could, you make me, could you go out and get me some bronze? Does anybody here know how to find a piece of bronze? Uh, do you know how to recognize the ore that has bronze in it? Then what do you add? How do you make it? How do you heat it up? How do you make fire? How do you do anything? We don't know how to do anything. We, I can't weave the cloth of this. Maybe it's, I don't even know if it's woven. Do you realize the, in, the total incapability of this audience? that we, and I'm joining you in this, we don't know how to do anything. Well, you maybe can string a racket. <laughs> but we're really a hopeless lot. And then layered on that is our inability to understand almost anything. In the front page of American newspapers, almost daily, they use the number a trillion about something. I'm going to tell you what a trillion is, and at the end of it, you'll understand how little you know about what a trillion is. And yet, I will tell you the truth. It's a made-up story. told to you by somebody who has made up their life. In the year one, there was never a year zero. The year one was created in the fourth century. They worked backwards and created the year one. Robert the Little, who was a, a monk 
was hired by the Pope or told by the Pope to create a calendar. We know the calendar is completely wrong and has nothing to do with the facts of any kind of history uh, related to Herod being still, well, it's just, it's just completely wrong. Trust me, it's at least 40 or 50 years wrong. It's not right. But that has nothing to do with a trillion, so we won't dwell there. But in the year one, somebody opens a store, small store. They have lots of inventory, but they run it so badly that they lose a million dollars the first day, and the second day, and the third day. And every day that first year, they lose a million dollars. You can call it shekels, you can call it whatever you want. They lost a million of them. And they did it the next year, and the next year. And then 366 million on the leap year. And they keep on losing a million dollars every day, every day, every year. And it's now 2014. And they'd have to, and they have long life, obviously. They would have to keep on losing a million dollars a day every year to 2138 to lose a trillion dollars. You can't put your arm around that. To me, one year's loss would be plenty, 365 million. But I'd be 2,137 years to go. And yet, politicians and bankers and business people, I guess, and newspaper writers keep on flipping off that number. A trillion this, a trillion that, besides the fact that it's often wrong, and when they say you're $14.7 trillion in debt, it's, you're really $34 trillion in debt because they don't count various things they really do owe and it doesn't show up. But what's the difference between 17 trillion and 34 trillion if you don't understand what one trillion is? Now, that doesn't seem like much, except it's a common word, and it's on the front page of the newspaper. And I dare say you can go through any article on the front page of any newspaper, and you can't explain it. You simply can't explain it. Our bad habits, uh, well, you've been following me around, and people ask me questions, and you see how bad the questions are. Are you keeping busy? I don't know what that means. Keeping busy. They, they don't know me, and I don't know what busy would mean. What would be, would be doing that? <laughs> What's their measure of busy? Um, how are you enjoying Singapore? There's really no answer to these questions. You understand that. Um, How's everything going? <laughs> How you doing? I suspect people really don't want to know from each other anything. And there's this great desire to fill in some unknown vacuum in the, in the air.